The Eye of the World by Robert Jordan. I've heard a lot of people say that once they're on book six, they'd like a refresher for book one. Of course, they don't want to go back and reread the whole thing. So I'm going to do a brief summary of what happens in book one of The Wheel of Time. If this gets enough traction and love, I might do the entire series. I don't know. Let's get into it. So the Eye of the World starts with Luz Theron Telamon wandering his palace, clearly have gone insane, and realizing he's murdered his entire family. This is because the Dark One in this world, the devil, the person that he, the Dragon Reborn, was born to fight, has tainted the male half of using magic, known as channeling, which draws from the source called Saedin, the Dark One tainted Saedin. So now, Luz Theron has gone insane because he's been touching this taint, and so is every man that uses magic, and he's murdered his entire family. Luz Theron then kills himself with a massive explosion. Fast forward a long time. Now we are set in a world where men who channel are hunted by women who can channel or use magic and gentled, which means they are cut off from being able to use magic and sometimes killed, sometimes left to wander until they kill themselves. Now we are uh, in a small village with a young man and his father walking down a dirt road. The man's name is Randall Thor and his father's name is Tam. Rand realizes there's a creepy rider behind him and this creepy rider is giving him pretty much a death glare even though Rand can't see his face he knows this to be true. Fast forward a little bit, Rand and his father are now in the town, and Rand realizes his two best friends, Matt and Perrin, have both also seen this dark, mysterious rider. There are three strangers in the town, and maybe it was one of them. We quickly learn it wasn't, because the three strangers are, one, a tiny little noblewoman named Moraine, and two, her bodyguard named Lan, who has been sworn to protect her. Or is it the third stranger named Tom Marilyn, who's a glee man with a happy, colorful cloak? No, it's not him. So, we fast forward a little bit, and Rand has gone home with his father, back to their farm, and their farm is attacked by Trollocs, shadow spawn created by the Dark One. Rand's father somehow pulls out a sword Rand did not know he had and kills a few of the Trollocs before they run off. Trollocs are essentially men mixed with beasts, and Murdral are essentially men mixed with paper. Rand's father, Tam, was gravely injured when he did this, unfortunately, so Rand must start dragging him toward the town. As these Rand is dragging him towards the town, his father starts rambling about how Rand is actually adopted and not his real son. This is a huge revelation to Rand, but was strongly hinted to us when they were first described, and Rand was described as looking very different. Rand always assumed he just looked like his mother, he doesn't remember his mother, his mother died when he was a child. They arrive at the town, and Rand quickly realizes that the town has also been attacked. It has been severely attacked by Trollocs and Murdral, and the town would have been completely burned down if it wasn't for the fact that the noblewoman and her bodyguard were actually an Aes Sedai and her warder, and warders are bonded to Aes Sedai in a way that makes them pretty much enhanced human beings. So, they came out and successfully fought off most of the Trollocs, and Tom Marilyn, the Gleeman, actually killed quite a few himself. The Aes Sedai then tells Rand, Matt, and Perrin that the Trollocs attacked because they were actually looking for one of the three boys and she does not know which, and they need to go to the White Tower, the home base of the Aes Sedai, to figure out which boy they were hunting. Three boys reluctantly agree to go, and as they are leaving, Rand's semi-girlfriend Egwene jumps in and says she is also coming. Moraine does not want her to come, but she insists, and they don't have time to argue, so Moraine agrees. They flee the town. While they are running, they are quickly starting to be pursued by Trollocs. Not all of them died, especially the ones that attacked Rand's farm. Uh, they flee quickly enough and reach a small city called Berlon. Well, in this city, they are in an inn, and a woman approaches Rand and says she has prophecies of the future, and that Rand will pretty much destroy the world. And she pretty much tells him that he is going to be the apocalypse. Rand does not take this news super well, obviously, and kind of tells her to go away and then ignores what happened for pretty much the rest of the book. So they leave the city of Berylon, not wanting the city to be attacked by the Trollocs, and at this point, Nynaeve has joined the party and wants the three boys to come home back to Emmons Field, their hometown. They refuse, saying they are being pursued by the Trollocs and Murdral. Nynaeve then insists on coming with them, which Moraine hates, but eventually lets happen. At this point, we learn that Egwene and Nynaeve can also both channel or use magic and have the potential to become Aes Sedai. Some people in the party are happy about this, some really hate it, but we move on. After leaving the city of Berylon, the party decides to go to a cursed city named Shadar Logoth. Shadar Logoth was a city populated by people who decided to fight evil by being so evil that evil would not want to mess with them. And it kind of worked. And then they all killed each other. So the city's now empty, but cursed. Evil itself, in essence, now kind of populates the city. So they flee into the city, and lo and behold, the Trollocs and Murdral are actually afraid to come in. So I guess it worked. You can fight fire with lava. So they are taking refuge in the city. Matt, Perrin, and Rand go off on their own to explore, like idiots, and go into a room where they see a massive amount of treasure and are approached by a character named Mordith, who says they should take some of the treasure, and it would be great. Mordith reveals himself to be the essence of evil, and they flee and go back to the main party. Once back at the main party, Moraine scorns them for 
leaving in the first place and pretty much calls them idiots, which they are. As nighttime falls, Murdral and Trollocs flood into the city because apparently the evil city is less scared to them at night. The party itself realizes they cannot stay within the city safely, so they run away. At this point, the Trollocs are pretty much on top of them, so unfortunately they get split up while they're running away. We now have three separate parties. We have Matt, Rand, Tom Marilyn, the Gleeman. We have Egwene and Perrin. And the final party is Nynaeve, Lan, and Moraine. So the first main party that we follow, uh, the three, Tom, Matt, and Rand, are fleeing through the forest and come to a river where there's a riverboat. They quickly get on the boat as quickly as possible because there are Trollocs pursuing them, and the crew is pretty angry until they realize they are actually being pursued by Trollocs. And then they decide to let the three on the boat so they can get away. Tom convinces the captain to let him stay on. By He will pay his way through entertaining the crew with his Gleeman skills, and he begins to train Rand and Matt with, into being Gleeman. We also learn at this point that Matt actually did take a piece of treasure from the Cursed City because he is an idiot. They eventually reach a city called White Bridge, where the three get off the boat and are walking through the city when a Murdral seems to pop out of nowhere and attack them. Tom, in an effort to defend the two boys, throws himself at the Murdral and tells the boys to run. They do, and Tom dies, and we have a moment of silence for Tom. Rand and Matt then run off on their own and try to make their way to Camelin, the capital city of Andor, the city, the country they are in, which was a predestined meet point for the party. Uh, they essentially pay their way by using Tom's uh, trained Gleeman skills uh, in different inns and eating very little and kind of just being on their own and sad and they're not doing well. They're essentially beggars. And it's interesting to see our main characters struggle so much. I kind of enjoy that aspect of this. During this time, they are attacked by dark friends and Rand kind of uses magic on accident at a high emotional point to kill the dark friends. I wonder at this point who the next dragon reborn is going to be. So the boys continue along the road and eventually do reach the city of Camelon. At this point, Matt is pretty much turning into a Smeagol-like character due to the dagger. He has essentially lost all of his original character and has just become a gigantic paranoid asshole. He is becoming skinny, not eating, and his eyes look demonic. They essentially rent a room in a inn and Matt goes in the room and barricades himself in. Rand, at this point, meets a very nice character named Loyal, who is an Ogier, this creature and they quickly become fast friends. Rand hears of a false dragon, a man who can channel who claimed to be the Dragon Reborn and tried to raise an army to do that, but failed, is being paraded through the city as by the Aes Sedai who caught him, and Rand wants to go see the false dragon. So Rand heads out to see the false dragon named Loghain, and while he's in the crowd, a beggar seems to approach him, and we learn that this beggar is actually Padon Fain, a merchant peddler from back in their original village. Rand presumed Padon Fain was dead, but now is very afraid and skeeved out by how Padon Fain looks, he does not look well. So Rand flees from Padon Fain to a wall. He realizes he can no longer see Loghain being paraded, so he decides to climb the wall. Rand climbs up the wall, sits on top, and watches Loghain go by. And as Loghain goes by, Loghain makes a lot of eye contact with Rand from a great distance, but he somehow makes eye contact and begins laughing. A lot. After Loghain passes by, a voice behind Rand starts talking, and Rand flips out, very startled, and falls off the wall. It turns out this is the princess of the capital city they are in, the daughter of the queen, Elaine Tracand. Couldn't get more stereotypical. Rand quickly befriends Egwene and her brother Gawain, who both seem to be nice people. Their other brother, Galad, then approaches and is clearly not a nice person. Galad's dick. Galad calls for the guards, and Rand is quickly arrested and brought before the queen. The queen interrogates Rand of why he was there, but while she is doing that, her Aes Sedai advisor, right next to her, apparently can also see prophecies, and when she looks at Rand, clearly sees that he will bring around a basically second apocalypse and destroy a lot of the world, and she tells the queen this. And the queen lets him go, even though someone who can see the future just told her that. Doesn't even interrogate him. Just kind of lets him walk out the front door. After he just met her daughter. Okay, so Rand goes back to the inn, and now we rewind. Back to Perrin and Egwene, who are fleeing from the Trollocs from Shadar Logoth. They run into a couple of wolves, and the wolves behave strangely, and then they run into a man named Elias Matura, who can talk to wolves, and he tells Perrin, you can also talk to wolves. Perrin, after learning he can talk to wolves, vehemently denies that he can do this, but eventually kind of figures out that he can. And he meets one wolf named Hopper, who's a very good friend of his right away. Perrin loves Hopper. We all love Hopper. Hopper's an adorable, awesome wolf. But unfortunately, they run into a group of White Cloaks, and the White Cloaks manage to capture Egwene and take her prisoner. Perrin, the wolves, and Elias then go to try and free Egwene from the White Cloaks. Unfortunately, the White Cloaks manage to kill one of the wolves, and it's Hopper. Perrin can now talk to wolves in his head, 
feels Hopper die, and it does not go well. In retaliation, Perrin kills White Cloaks. To your average person, this is a man going insane, behaving like a wolf, and killing people because they killed a wolf. White Cloaks are religious fanatics who hate everything to do with magic, and believe everything to do with magic has to do with the Dark One. So this does not look good for Perrin. But he manages to save Egwene, and allies him and some wolves and Egwene, and while well, they run off in the woods, eventually run into some people called the Athan Mier. The Athan Mier are extreme pacifists who believe in no violence whatsoever, even to the point where they will let Trollocs kill their family. They are literally the biggest pacifists in existence. They essentially tell Perrin of their ways, Perrin says that's dumb, and they move on. After a while of traveling, they run into Lan, Nynaeve, and Moraine. Land Naive and Moraine have essentially done nothing in this time but travel and argue. It has become very clear that Nynaeve has a crush on Lan, but beyond that, there is not much else going on besides Moraine and Nynaeve yelling at each other not getting along. Although, they didn't meet up with Perrin and Egwene, and they travel to Camelon, where they meet up with Rand, Matt, and Loyal. Matt is clearly very, very much so possessed at this point, and has the characteristics of maybe the girl from The Exorcist. Moraine does the best she can with her magic to separate him from the dagger that is doing this, but while he gets his personality back and is maybe not quite so possessed, he is still definitely dying and being drained by the dagger. They cannot take the dagger away because if he is separated at this point, he would go through such an extreme withdrawal, he would for sure die. Unfortunately, instead of being able to take him straight to the White Tower where the Aes Sedai could heal him, Loyal tells Moraine of the fact that the Eye of the World, the title, is about to be threatened by maybe something dangerous. Moraine decides it is very important and crucial that they go and see if the Eye of the World is going to be attacked and they must investigate. So they decide to take the Ways. Side note, the Ways are ancient portals that were made a long time ago. Essentially stone doorways, tree is on the door. You take one leaf off, door opens, you go in. Every one step you take in this world equals roughly 100 in the real world, meaning you can move super fast. They take these Ways all the way through to the Blight, or the borders of the Blight, where a couple cities are that continually flight the Blight, where the Dark One lives and sends his armies to try to break through the borderlands. Come out in a city called Faldara. In Faldara, they ask the head of one of these cities to help them go to the Eye of the World to see what is going on. He says no because there's a Trolloc army coming and the Trolloc army is bad and he needs all of his reinforcements possible to help him fight off this Trolloc army. Moraine says fine, she'll take the party on her own to go see if the Eye of the World is in danger. They walk off into the Blight, and after a while reach the Eye of the World, where the Green Man, the Guardian of the Blight, is waiting for them. He is essentially, in my mind, the Jolly Green Giant. After inspecting the Eye of the World, which is a pure, untainted pool of Sayadeen, Moraine realizes that there is no immediate threat and begins to leave. As she is leaving, two characters walk into the clearing. They are two Forsaken. Side note, Forsaken are servants of the Dark One that have been imprisoned with him for a long time. The fact that they are coming out is a very bad sign because it means the prison around the Dark One is weakening. All Forsaken are essentially his greatest servants and are very, very good at what they do, killing and wreaking havoc through using magic. So these two Forsaken are clearly here to do something to the Eye of the World, and the Green Man decides to stop them. He attacks one of the Forsaken and manages to kill one of them, but also dies during the attempt. The remaining Forsaken now has to deal with our party. The party does fight with him very briefly, but quickly it is now just a fight between Rand and the remaining Forsaken. Rand somehow manages to steal the man's ability to use Sayadeen, or somehow manipulate it, it is not exactly clear, and kills the Forsaken. During this time, Rand is somehow transported to a place where he can see the battle that is happening between Faldara and the Trolloc army, and Rand uses his new ability to decimate the Trolloc army. Rand then kind of teleports back to where he was in the clearing where the Eye of the World is, and runs up to Moraine, very afraid, screaming, oh my god, I can channel, am I going to go insane and kill everyone around me? And Moraine responds, Maybe. So, that is The Eye of the World. I hope you enjoyed my very rushed summary of the book that I have not read in over a year. I hope I did a semi-decent job. Uh, I might continue to do the entire series if you guys like this enough. Uh, I certainly had a good time doing it. And please, of course, like and subscribe if you're not already. And let me know your thoughts down below, what I should change, maybe what I should do a little different. As always, like and subscribe. Have a great day. Peace.